have communications specialist from Sherson Willis, Trish Sherson. Welcome to the show, Trish. How are you this morning? Good morning, Wallace. Merry Christmas. Good, Merry Christmas to you. And we have journalist Sour Manning Sowen. Welcome to the show. How Thank you, are Wallace. You? Hi, Trish. Hi, Good, good to have you. What? What? what how, do, how? How? does Christmas unfold in your household, Sal? And what do you do? Oh, with a rub of the eye and thinking, <laughs> is it morning already? You know, <laughs> that's yeah. about it. But uh, yeah, like everybody else, I think you know you get up and share some time with family. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. I'm. Uh, the issue this week, um, front page for the last four pages of the New Zealand Herald, at least, Trish Sherson has been Len Brown, hasn't it? Um, what do you think? Does he have the trust of Aucklanders? Because what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in the polls is that he does not. I don't think he does, and I don't think he has uh, the confidence of the, of the council either, even though we found out this week, uh, amazingly, that under council standing orders you can't have a vote of no confidence, which I found pretty astonishing. Uh, I was really interested this week, actually, in two things. Yeah. One is that, you know, along the way through this dreadful saga, uh, Len had learned the, uh, earned the nickname Pants Down Brown. And then on Wednesday, I think, you saw the Herald give him a complete down trowel and a full front page that said, you know, what did it say? Time to go. Time to go, Len. Time to go, Len. Big black letters in a cartoon, huh? Big black letters. The yeah. other very interesting thing has been the total radio silence from five of the Auckland councillors who haven't said... A, a word on the matter whatsoever um, and I just wonder what that silence actually means obviously you know not not wanting to to have a go at Len but if you look at the weight of what the public is and ratepayers are yeah. saying about this um, hard to see that you can maintain a silence because you are there to represent your mm. constituents I wonder whether Len is, is in fact suffering a bit from a Christ-like com complex where he's sort of feeling that he's going through this own, his own, this personal suffering for the greater good, but I think it's actually mm. very damaging for Auckland. Do you think so? Oh, totally damaging for Auckland, and I mean, you only need to look at the list of things that he hasn't been able to deliver on over the last three months because um, he's been totally tied up in all mm. of this mess. Well, I know, so and he hasn't been to things like the Santa Parade, and he, he, he made a mark of uh, getting out there and going to things, didn't he? He's been very um, quiet in events, but here is, uh, I guess, South Auckland's man. How much of it is a behind-the-scenes political thing. You've got uh, centre-right or right-wing councillors like Dick Quacks, Cameron Brewer really um, having a go. What What are your thoughts? Oh, well, they should be, and they are. Um, they're, they're exposing um, a lot of dialogue around uh, where Len has been, obviously, where he should be going. Um, Len Brown, he was you know, the big hope of South Auckland, like, like you've underscored there. Um, he is no longer, and as we've said so many times on this particular program since all of this news broke after the elections, that he is no longer able to deliver the policies of which he was given a mandate to do. Um, and that... That mandate wasn't for him necessarily as mayor. It was for the policies that he represented in the last term. He is an extraordinarily good politician in a sense of pre um, pre presenting a vision. Um, mm. The vision needed to be implemented. That's what the sizable vote was about. It hasn't been able to. From here, yeah. I think that the Auckland Council is in danger of being replaced, at least the Mayor being replaced by a Commissioner. Yep. I wrote a piece yep. to this effect on Thursday, um, and it seemed to gain um, a lot of attention, particularly from the right-wing areas. Um, if you look at it, the things that Trish has outlined there, one, a damage to the Auckland brand, and she knows what she's talking about with branding. Um, there's the other thing relating to being able, like Trish said, mm -hmm. to roll out policies and what hasn't been done in the, since the election. That's that's crucial. The other thing is the economic confidence of, of the governance body. The economics of Auckland need to be well oiled. It's not just about trains. There's all sorts of things. Now, if your eye is off the board as the lead governor, the right. mayor of this area, then New Zealand is going to suffer for this. This is a nationwide issue. If you lay in all of those points up mm. one after another, the government obviously is going to be watching this very closely. If it doesn't sort out soon, mm. then that's, I think, is what's well, going to happen yeah. by the end of the financial wow. year. If, if Len refuses to move, that is the likely consequence. My message to him has been, Len, let the people of Auckland have their say on who is going to be leader. Get out of the road and let an election take place. Don't let it be the choice of those in the beehive. Gosh, those are very, very strong words there. Um, when it comes to branding, can I just put it to you, though, that this is not 
um, a Toronto mayor smoking crack and um, involved in criminal offence. And Ernst Young report found that he did not, uh, in the terms of reference, he did not misuse funds for this two-year affair. Am I missing something here? Well, let's re- Am let's, I missing something? Let's remember one of the critical things in politics is perception. So you've now, is it? Yes, it is. So you've now got, you know, the mayor is in, is, is, <clears throat> is in his view of reality, but the perception of ratepayers is quite another thing. And yes, as the mayor keeps pointing Pointing out, you know, the EY report didn't find any wrongdoing in relation to his affair. Yes, there were some phone calls and things. But what it did highlight, and I think the Herald um, really summed this up well when they said, you know, grace, favour and entitlement. I think that was an excellent summation. The, this view that he's a guy that, you know, has been um, really not up front not up front about his brand or what he right. really what he what is really behind that brand um, the way he has used his um, used his office and um, you know even in terms of things like the hotel rooms I just I think though there is now a point where Len Brown is putting himself above the city and the interests well, of the city I don't care about the morality of all of that you know it's got its place but I'm not even preoccupied with it I, like Wallace like you you I can from South Auckland. I live in Mount Albert mm. now and have done for some time. But I, I know the kind of policies that the people attached to out there. This is about politics here. Len can't deliver those. He There isn't the confidence around the council chamber for him, nor amongst the officials. And I'd suspect the sizable proportion of those in Auckland do not have that confidence anymore. It is about perception. It is about the having that confidence brand. Politics doesn't have a power that's, that starts um, on election mm. day when you get your numbers tallied and it's absolute and static all the way through to the next election. It's like an arc. It goes up and down, yeah. it dims and fades, and that is the important but thing. Can I, can I put it to you both that um, uh, this is one of the largest pulling together uh, projects that we've ever had, the pulling together of a super city, the boroughs, the infighting, the squabbling that the history of Auckland has had. Mm. And you're talking about a man with a vision, uh, a reconciler, and there's only one person who could have done that, and that is Liam Brown. Yeah, well, he's well, done it. Yeah. He hasn't delivered on that, um, hasn't been given the chance, and that chance has been taken away from him, and he can't put the point, point the finger at anyone else. That, no, that's right. And, and also, so no one can take away from him what he did in that first term. Mm. But, you know, in politics, it's like sport. You're only as good is your last game and so what has happened now is that people are focused on on the future i mean i've heard len this week repeatedly mm. saying oh well hey you know i've i've been re-elected well only because people didn't know about mm. this stuff sitting in the background no he wouldn't we, have been elected we would have would had he, a totally yes. different result especially, especially the stuff relating to the um the, you know the, the uh, convention center the sky city convention center that is the big tipping point on that's this. right you hang know, on the, was that just was it five nights it does, it's thirty nine thousand dollars, Wallace. If some company but, but, is going to put across freebies of thirty nine thousand dollars accumulated here, albeit. But the the fact of the matter is here. It's a cost mm. benefit pr- pr- um, uh, th- uh, formula and, and equation there. Um, Len would know that there was a major change in his shift relating to that centre, and he implied that it was the economy. And perhaps that was, but there was always once again that perception. Let's boil it down to confidence and spending mm. and things like that. Um, you know, I'll take it right there. Yeah. You know, as a rate payer, um, I forgot to to uh, register my dog. Yep. Next thing, I get a dog officer, you know, turns up at the door, knocking. Says, you've forgotten to do it. So, oh, I've tried on the, online a few times and it didn't work, mm-hmm. but I was getting around to it. I can do it now if you've got a thing. And she says, yeah, I've got an F- I credit card thing. So they did it, paid it. As soon as it went through, she says... Oh, and here's a $300 fine for not paying. Right. And I said, why didn't you tell me that in the first instance? So I wrote to the council and they said, oh, no, no, we're not going to waiver that, even though you paid it. And I kind of think to myself, what a load of rubbish. You know, that here's the mayor and others swanning about getting freebies. Um, even Cameron Brewer looks like he didn't declare a few freebies here. Mm. And then ratepayers, I'm, I'm not trying to make myself into a Marty. I'm just saying that a mind shift of a person who's been totally oh. supportive of a council and a super city mm. being formed, this kind of thing, you think, well, isn't there an us and them thing yes, going on? Yes, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And so, again, it comes back to... 
uh, right back to the start, what you were saying, Trish, perception amongst the minds of Aucklanders and New Zealanders is really where it's at. Well, and I think what you've seen through this, and a lot of people have made this comment, Kiwis are inherently, we're really fair. We like to give people, if people make a stuff up, we're, we're, mm. we're pretty good at saying, okay, get that, let's, um, let's give them a second mm. chance. But what they're seeing here is a guy, they don't feel A, gets it, and B, then every time you think, yes, the mayor said it's all out in the open, something else comes out. So they've, they've actually lost, they've totally lost mm. confidence, and they don't trust him fundamentally, and that's a big problem. And then, you know, you get, um, this is going to start just sort of, Grubbing yeah. up other things. I see in the pa- in the paper this morning, Dick Quack saying, there might well, be more. well, don't let Len Brown meet George, um, Kate and Wills when they come here and baby George. Mm. You know, we oh, don't want Royals mm. shaking his hand. Mm. So until Len goes, we're going to have this kind of Paul, just grubby sort of Paul hanging over. Yeah, it won't Auckland. go away. It won't go away. Once right. the brand is b- um, bucket like in that way it will it won't it is not going to go away we are with uh, trish sherson uh, and Sowen manning talking about the issues over the week uh this really uh blew me away it's been extraordinary this case the woman dubbed the black widow was already serving a prison sentence during her murder trial uh, helen milner was found guilty of murdering philip nisbet who was her second husband, and it uh, was revealed that Milner has served five months home detention for stealing $29,000 off her employer in 2009, and during her murder trial, she was already locked up. I don't know, but what do you, first, have you folks been following, this one? have you been following this? Um, mostly through television, yeah. reporters and a bit of the New Zealand Herald, you know, from up here. Um, it reminded me, actually, of the Louise Nicholas case when it was revealed that Brad Shipton uh, and... So there was another guy who was already serving yeah, Sholem, uh, Sholem mm. uh, who was already serving time in prison for uh, for, for other offences. What do you make of this? Do you think that everything should be shown in a trial, presented in a trial? No, I don't. Um, I, I I think that the police are privy to all of that previous offending. Um, it helps the police to really look at these potential suspects with a, an intensity, perhaps that a person without a record wouldn't have. Right. It, it also flags up to the police, OK, really check them out. If they are the prime suspect and they look like they're the person who's done it, the pre- prima facie case stacks up in this particular offence, it makes them do their job 100% better than perhaps if they took the easy road and provided all of that previous form before a jury. What do you think? What do you think, uh, Trish? Do you think that, I mean, people have histories and histories help you build knowledge on uh, what actions happen now? Well, I think I think Selwyn's exactly right. Let's remember the other um, high-profile case where there were um, other details mm. suppressed, and that was you and McDonald mm. with, a, with a list of offending mm. that we found out of, of, off the back of that. Uh, and in that case, Justice France ruled that it was in a, inadmissible partly because it would be uh, prejudicial. I think that is the reality for a jury. As Selwyn said, mm. at, at, on the police side, they know all of that, and it helps them with the investigation and, and who they're pursuing but in terms of a jury you can't um, ask people to convict someone on the basis that they've done mm. a- other things and that was right. also Greg King's argument in the Ewan yes, McDonald right. case just because you've done A doesn't necessarily mean that you've done B even though Actually, it might show a, a pattern That's a very good example isn't it because uh, people were horrified about the when they found out about the um, hammering the heads of all those animals the cars, the cars. Right. Yeah. I think what comes into play is in the sentencing if the person is found guilty um, the, the judge is going to be aware of all of that detail and it will be mm. reflected in the sentencing in a murder case obviously you know there's you know, how much time is in uh, imprisonment mm. time is going to be there but Jen I, I remember years ago you know well I was in my 20s and went mm. on to a um, jury in the high court yes. and it was a, a heroin um, charge. There were two people up. One of the biggest dilemmas that came through was one you could see was the total victim um, as a as a, an addict, and the yeah. other one was the big pusher. You know, and we're talking really plugged into the Mister Asia type of stuff at that stage. Mm. The jury's job was to find who was guilty, and one of the concerns in the jury room was, well, gee, this guy's less guilty. Than, he's guilty, but he's less guilty than that guilty guy because he, <laughs> he's he's the victim here. Um, Yeah, but he's been peddling heroin, but, you know, so you had to go out with a guilty verdict. Um, And I remember the 
get, you know, after the, that went out, that somebody said, um, don't worry, mm. um, the judge will sort out the proportion of, of sentence. Good and heavens. it did go that way. Um, one guy got something like 10 years yes. for a thing, the other guy got two and a half or something and, and a course of rehabilitation and all sorts of things attached to it. Mm. Um, so in some ways there was a confidence really in the judicial process. If you start throwing things around at the jury level, um, it complicates things oh, even more. Okay. And, and what, what difference is it like Wallace, you go and do a heinous crime or something like that and they say, but Wallace has got no form, surely. He's an angel. Yeah, I see. You know? Well, I am an angel, so yeah. that's, that's, yeah, that's a stupid example. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't really yeah. followed this case, to be honest. I mean, I'd seen it, you know, popping up through the week. I hadn't had time to really focus on it until um, yesterday. I think you and I were talking about mm. it a bit on Twitter, but I read a fantastic p piece by Blair Ensor on stuff where he had actually gone through this, and it's an extraordinary story behind this case. I mean, this person is obviously, mm -hmm. I, I think her, her mother, her 82-year-old yeah. mother even said, you know, she was, what did you say? How did you describe her, Wallace? Monstrously yeah. complicated? That's or the Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> deeply complicated. De deeply complicated. <laughs> We're with Sal and Manning and Trish Sherson looking at the week's issues uh, and looking ahead as well. Text live to 3920. Your thoughts are most welcome. We're also on Twitter as well, at Radio Live uh, NZ. Uh, so, Trish, we come into the end of 2013 and we'll look what's happened. National uh, still really quite high in the polls. Labour had a bit of a blip there uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, with David Cunliffe. Um, what are you seeing? You said something very interesting off air about the barbecue chats that people have, which I thought was really interesting. Well, I think there's that old um, saying in politics that you want to give people something good mm. to talk about over the barbecue season, and I think National will be pretty happy. Will they? Mm. Um, mm. You know, I think a lot of it is, is down to the work that Bill English has done around the economy. People feel that uh, it's been pretty well helmed through a, a, a rough time. We've come through well, and if you look at, I was just reading even in the paper this morning about the latest ANZ business uh, confidence indicator way up uh, good growth predicted next year the numbers that Bill English has just released you know we're looking at we've already had sort of three percent growth I think and we're looking at building on that next year and for me the the proof of, in the pudding is when um, you know you get clients starting to come to you thinking about making big investments and saying look um, now is the time because really? we actually feel we, we've got confidence in the economy and its stewardship and mm. we've come through the difficult times and we're now looking at um, investing and growing so i think there's a real feeling of positivity out there mm. yes people are saying well we might look we might have interest rate rises next year we will have interest rate rises so people may not be um some might not be uh, better off but i think the country on the whole is feeling good and i think that that causes a difficulty for Labour to try and get some traction because they, to date, I have felt have played a fairly negative um, negative communication strategy around um, you know the economy and, and the way the government's running things. They need to recalibrate that a bit because I think people are, they're actually feeling relatively positive. So and what do you make of that? I mean you've, we've got a, a shiny new leader, he was um, you know inaugurated September the 15th uh, and hit the ground running with you know those sharp sound bites and a highly talented highly capable individual david cunliffe uh a bit of a blip but yet here we are uh the same thing happens every year national still coming in uh on really what can only be described as somewhat of a wave what are you what are you seeing Two, here 2014 will be all about the economy irrespective of what party it's going to be um, pushing the message what what's happened here too is national's trying to actually make sure it gets in front of this good news machine um and knowing all well that there are two other factors that are in play that's the hard work of every working new zealander in this country mm. that has helped to create a more positive atmosphere and it's trying to claim that carte blanche. Um, the other thing is, is there's been a turn in the global economics as well and New Zealand has been well placed and well governed in that sense um, to be able to make 
the most of the next couple of years. The other problem mm. is for for national is a lot of the benefits that we're sitting about and we're feeling good about yes. are short term mem- uh, remedy uh, type of uh, consequences, asset sales and that type of thing. Yeah, even though they're fizzed. I mean, that some of the underlying challenges. Now, you know, we've always, irrespective of how good we feel, we've got to look at the challenges to make sure that the future is better. The current account deficit in this country has been spiralling out of control for over a decade. There is no policy solutions to that. We we talk about um, health care and things like that that's big in the news this week. Now the government knows that the owners of most of those health care providers are overseas, that they've structured their economies themselves as companies so that the New Zealand operations own a debt to overseas. It contributes to our current account mm. deficit. Taxpayer money of all of us feeling good, making yeah. this country get ahead, see a large proportion of our taxpayer money going to these places yeah. and then siphoned off overseas. Sure. Banking is not just the one contributor. So there are huge issues that national should do also right. in the, e- um, the export lead areas. You know, we know that export raw commodity is going offshore in good numbers and that's great We, you know, but the problems are you go down to Napier, you look at the ports of Napier and there are logs going offshore. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of logs a week going out of New Zealand to overseas for other countries to manufacture. The manufacturing export bases in the provinces is being neglected and National has done nothing about uh, that. What about the messages though, the messages that Labour uh, need to need to do last election it was uh, at least as I saw it was about asset sales what are they going to have to do what messages are going to have to come out of David Cunniff's mouth to, or Russell Norman's mouth and Matera Turo's mouth to convince uh, voters that there is another government in the waiting well, I think that's where Labour has got some work to go. I mean, I think Selwyn makes some great points about um, some of these issues. And, you know, fair enough, every government is going to claim that it was their work. And I saw Bernard Hickey this morning making a good point about, you know, now our reliance is on one um, export uh, product, which mm. is uh, milk, and, and into one country, which is which is China. So I think as a country, we've still got a long way to go in terms of value add to what we make here, not just ship it off for someone else to to make Mm. the dollar on it. Um, But I do think... But that's not a voter concern. No, it's... It is for those in the provinces. Those who who haven't got... If you go down to Napier, there's a swing happening in Napier and there's a reason for that and that's because a lot of the people at the working level are not benefiting from the economic upturn that others are experiencing in the urban areas. There is a crossover between the provincial economies and the national economies. We, We focused on Auckland earlier and how important it is. The provinces... Uh, very important too. Yes, um, I'm underscoring what what um, what Trish is saying there. You know that it, it is a very important aspect. Well, I, th- yeah. I think there was a great piece yesterday by John Armstrong. Yeah. His kind of sum- summing up of it, and and what he actually looked at is what is relevant to voters, and basically saying you know outside of the the, the Beltway in quote mm. marks um, in Wellington, a lot of what happens in politics, uh, people aren't interested in or actually don't want to know. They don't actually want to have um, government in their lives or to be worrying about what the, no, what they the don't, politicians do they? are fighting about. They don't want to worry about. about it. But what he pointed to, which I thought was a good yeah. point, was John Key's ability to read what is important to people and make judgment calls on, on when to make policy changes on the basis I of that. I picked up on that too. Now, if mm. you think of Key's background um, from his days as a, tra- as a trader, one of his great skills that was recognised was his ability to talk to the the market mm. and I think it's the same exactly the same principles apply to the electorate so I think he's got he, he's a real asset to national in that way and you would have to say and this is what Labour and the Greens have to have to weigh up um, the the key English working partnership with one as the as the front man and one as the back room back room uh, worker actually works phenomenally mm. well. I think Do you Trish, agree with that, yeah, Selwyn? I think what Trish has um, hit on there is absolutely right in that um, what we will see in 2014 is National making a big focus on moderate centrist politics. Um, the problem is is that that's the recipe to win. It's not necessarily the recipe that satisfies national stakeholder groups and, and core supporters of, of a successful government. So they're under pressure from two ways. They've been saying to their support base and their stakeholders for 
you know, since 2008, yeah, yeah, we'll reform mm. these things, but we've got to do it by degrees, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. And then others are saying, well, how long have we got to wait? So mm. they're in that kind of pressure position there. Um, the other thing is we know that a lot of the governance botch-ups that we've seen month after month after month under the national-led government have not really been resolved until the public says, oh, we've had enough and, oh, this is ridiculous. And then you mm. will see John Key going and selling that to the yeah. public. At some stage, there mm. will be a tipping point on, on whether or not people well, see this guy's magic at okay, for what it I is. Guess I'm wanting to ask, uh, I guess what I'm asking you, Selwyn, is that you there were some big opportunities uh, this year to really uh, dent those polls. Mm. The, uh, the fiasco around the Global Communication Security Bureau, that, the, the bill there, yep. uh, you had the uh, shocking um, winds um, hiccups where personal information exactly. was open to war. I mean, that was astonishing. Mm. And yet, as Trish says, we go into Christmas, we go into the Christmas barbecue seeing John Key at a real high mm. and national doing well. Yeah, I, I, I look beyond the real highs. Um, the the mm. other thing is I think in election year we will see um, more of these issues coming to fore. Um, we are in an election year, so all of those other parties, in, including those that support John Key, will have their own solutions to those problems. Right. And so all of those solutions will be weighed up against each other and John Key's will be in amongst that mix and people will have a menu of choice. Yes. And I think that's where you see a true juxtapositioning of the parties by a proportion of their percentage of support from the public. And it's an interesting time to win. Uh, Labour for Labour to win, in my view, mm -hmm. three things, Wallace. It's got to be able to give South Aucklanders in their mass a reason to vote. That's one thing. So there'll be policy adjustments to do that. Secondly, it needs those provinces. It needs a swing in the provinces. It's not going okay. to get. It's not going to achieve what it did in South 1999. Auckland, provinces, provinces, and it's got to have a cross-party accord with the Greens. Now, it's, there is a sizable, sizable membership base and activist base inside the Green Party that's saying we don't want to be in coalition government. Right. Now, unless Russell Norman and Materia Ture solve that problem amongst their own party, what's going to happen a year out? Is it going to be under those internal stresses? So those are things where Labour has a role in working with the Greens to sure. make sure it is stable from the inside right. to govern. All right. Uh, just briefly, Trish. I, I think it's going to be one of the most fascinating elections that we've so seen for a long I. time. So do I. And, right down to the wire. Right? And, yes. and what Selwyn is pointing to, you've got a tension on both sides with national attention mm. in the centre and pushing on on the right. Labour also has that problem. Remember, Cunliffe, his supporters come from the affiliated unions and we've seen a lot more mm. uh, sort of leftist move from Labour. So he's going to have to at some point moderate that as well back to the centre. So mm. it's, And we're going to see um, probably a new kind of coalition that we haven't mm. seen before mm. with Colin Craig coming yes, in. Yes, of so course. It's going to be absolutely yep. fascinating. I, I think absolutely. So with, with, with respect to David Cunliffe, I, I think listeners have got an opportunity by the sound of it in, from 9 till 10 to mm. have a listen. We'll see more of that. I think a lot of the perception in the public of David Cunliffe has been what's been filtered out from the news media and his own party and others. You know, So it's a version of a view of the guy. I think through 2014 they'll get to see much more of the guy themselves and make their own views. Uh, yes, for, look, forget Taylor Swift, forget Beyonce. Um, my ticket night, my money is going to be trying to buy a ticket to the election debate between David Cunliffe and John Key. <laughs> yeah, You're a geek, the, show, Wallace. You're the, a geek. The key, oh, yeah. the key thing will be show us the money and seeing what reaction you get, and I think there might be a pretty good there, reaction. There, there you go. You could, you can, we can, you can come up with a slogan oh. and, and during the air break, Trish. Wonderful. Uh, who can you trust? I'll show start us working the money. on that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go with Sal Manning and Chris Sherson. Welcome back. Well, uh, just looking over the year, it's been a busy year, a big year, uh, and so much has happened. And as you were, as you were saying off air, Trish, you know, it was even this this year, 2013, that uh, Paul Holmes passed away. Yeah. But it seems so much has happened. So much has happened, and I and that was huge news back then. Oh, it was mm. and. Um, well, Paul was obviously an old boss of mine, and I opened the paper. That's right. Yeah, so I was a producer for him on, on Homes, and a um, oh. couple of funny things happened yesterday. One is I opened the paper yesterday, mm. and the Herald had a fantastic sort of photographic, mm. you know, memory of the year, and there was Paul and, and Deborah when he was... Um, 
knighted mm. and I thought gosh it's amazing to think that's almost a year ago um, and it reminded me of a great story of, of Paul if yeah. I can just tell it quickly yeah. there was a, um, a terrible landslip at Paikokareki and Paul um, as you know had of our morning meeting for the Homes Programme and decided that Paul would come down and do what we used to call a walkabout and we'd go up to Paikok mm. and walk around and talk to people anyway so I'm a country girl so I said to Paul well yeah. one thing that happens when you go to these places people you know will have afternoon tea so we'll take so we had bags of Sally Lunn buns from New World <laughs> Paul's in a suit he's got his red bands on he's covered in mud I mean it was you know waist deep mud mm. through the whole town he's carrying these as he kept saying them rock and Sally Lunn buns <laughs> anyway and the cameraman's there and we stopped to look over yeah. a back fence and we were looking down there are these two women literally waist deep in muddy water right. looking at their positions floating around one of them looked up and she said oh it's Paul Holmes <laughs> and and you know it was sort of Paul's mm. it was like a neighbor had they'd suddenly looked up and saw a neighbor oh it's Paul and Paul said well how can we get come into your place so we went around the corner and in the back gate and here are these two women dripping and the cap no camera mm. rolling Paul stood in the middle of the garden path put both his arms out and these women fell into his arms sobbing gave them a pat on the back yeah. and then said hey should we go inside and have a cup of tea? And to me, that summed Paul up. Wow. It didn't matter who he, you know, I'd done interviews with him with the Dalai Lama, you know, and then you have these these women, and he, every mm. person he met, he found something genuinely interesting about them. It's a nice memory, because he, he was a person, so, and this is not uh, always the case with broadcasters, he was interested in his subject, wasn't he? I think so, you know, yeah. I, I didn't know the man at yeah. all, but I remember years ago, I was... Um, I was an inspector with the SPCA before I went into journalism, oh. and he the home show was early in its its piece, and I had to take these little mutts, you know, these little <laughs> pups along to Cornwall Park because Paul Holmes was going to be doing a photo shoot, I think, with a young girl who had um, cerebral palsy, maybe. Right. I think I think that's what it was, and the, these little pups. Um, who knows what their lineage was, you know. Um, and they were sitting there on his knees and he says, oh, they've brought a few pets of their own along, look. <laughs> you know, meaning this, they had fleas, you know. And he just had a wonderful touch with that, that woman. And I, I suppose, you know, there was so much criticism of Paul over the years in different ways. Yeah. Those kind of things balanced the man out, the human in, in Paul and that human touch he had. Um, and I just remember those fantastic um, early stages of the home show that irrespective of what party the politician um, that was mm. in government at the time, they got a grilling and it was the public interest that was put before them on yeah. every time to be testing their, uh, their resolve. That, that was good stuff. It's a nice memory. And it seems yeah. so long ago. A massive, he year. had a massive, I always thought, thought of it, it might be the wrong way to express it, but he had a, a, a huge amount of humanity and it and it came through with his staff. On, I mean, this was very stressful. Right. And, I, you know, I'd always could rely on Paul at two minutes to seven every night if I'd organised the big political interview of the night. The phone would go, it would be Paul at two minutes to seven saying, is this the best we can do? Is this really the best interview? And it was, as a, as a youngish Juno at that time, it's I've carried that with me through my professional life thinking it you always have to stop and think doesn't matter how much work you've done can I do this better but that, that would be something I'd like to put to our politicians can you do something better you know this this whole thing about the GCSB that, and this is your story this my, is your big, my big story yeah your, your story for the year that, okay. that pathetic segue into this kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was pathetic actually no, it was, it was it's so transparent no, no, you know, everybody go. at home will be listening thinking that that's it oh, that was man. pretty lame Sally yeah, yeah, pretty but, lame. but, but <laughs> this is your story of that <laughs> is my time to shine man you know? Uh, um, you know the GCSB you know the, to me that soul uh, that that um, uh, that just did not uh, resolve the way that you would expect the Kiwi way to come through, and I think there was a dis detachment there. It seems like um, at the end of the day, we're serving masters that live overseas as opposed to those in New Zealand. We always should, I think, it in this really country, has been serve the, story the people here of the first. year, both in New Zealand and across the world, even as we speak. all down on that area. If you've got nothing to hide, Selwyn, mm. you've got nothing to fear. 
but you've got a lot to fear if those that know the information can trawl through and put it in a way that can kind of construct mm. something against you in the future and mm. that's always the concern in a liberal democracy mm. what are you what what are you what are you hoping for what do you think the big story will be for um 2014 so and i see look you know i mean as we talk about the mm. confidence is improving here we have front page more children are asking father christmas for basic necessities instead of toys so there's almost like a a two-geared thing going on in new zealand where yeah. you've got uh, people who are doing quite well and you know, a lot are just just the heads are above the water that's what i feel yeah you know i think a lot of it what would be a fantastic thing a momentum a movement if you like is to actually boil away all the prejudices irrespective of our color or our religions or creed wherever we come from and actually f focus on the things that need to be done um, who's to blame for the children in this country some of them going hungry in large proportions well, who cares about what the cause? Why don't we just find some solutions? And that would be a fantastic story for 2014. Trish? Yes, I totally mm. agree. I mean, I, I've got mm. two um, children, and, and so Christmas is a pretty exciting time mm. in our in our house. Mm. But reading that story today, it does remind you that we are not doing a good job uh, for, for for a lot of our we're kids. We're not there yet, are we? We're not there mm. yet. And I and like Selwyn, I mean, I get sick of. People why should we have food in schools? Why, you know, why can't families pay for that? Well, the reality is that a lot of families, they just can't get it together. And the very least we can do is make sure that if kids are going to school, they've got something to eat so they can yeah. be learning when, while they're there. And those kids are doing it themselves with some damn good teachers out there. And that's a part of the curriculum. It's a part of that's learning. And let's put a thumbs up celebration um, for that kind of stuff. Trish Scherz is so amazing. Hey, happy Christmas, Trish. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Wallace. And thank you for joining us this year. It's thank been you great. for having me. And same to you, Sal. And it's been a pleasure having you uh, in for the year as well. Yeah, happy Christmas, Wallace, and, and, and to everybody out there. This yeah. is great. Take